to um, play a video first. Yeah, right. not, not yet, no. Oh, 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 I just, I just sorry. want to introduce oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so yeah, um, just to tell you a bit about my background and how I kind of planned this presentation. So I'm a social psychologist. Uh, and I did research on eco-villages and sustainable communities, which are often termed cults. Um, and I was focusing on uh, spirituality and the politics, so influence and power, uh, specifically minority influence. But my background is also in criminal psychology, mm. specifically criminology, where I did a lot of work on critical criminology. So that's kind of my background, and so you m might be able to follow the processes of how I thought about these topics. And I'm currently living in a community, and there are a lot of um, academic people there. <laughs> this is the community we met in. Yeah, exactly. Grace <laughs> hates it, which I, I, I love that, that you hate it. I don't know why. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, we'll talk about yeah. why. Okay. <laughs> <Later>. um, <laughs> Why I like that she hates it? Yeah. Because... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying like Later. She, it's, yeah. Yeah, but this is a lunch conversation, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The table's going to be full. We're all going to be there. Just ask Grace. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know why I hate it. <laughs> so, when Grace asked me to do like a presentation on cults, I kind of gathered all of these people, all of these academics in the community, and we started discussing it and reading different um, literature and stuff like that and just comparing the notes and how we thought about these processes. And uh, one of the students there came up and showed me this video and I thought, this is great. This is something I have to show you. So I'm going to play this video for you. It's very short. It's from TED Ed. So Ted obviously did um, this educational video and it's basically made according to Yanya Lalic, which is um, who's one of the, the, the academics who really goes deep into the uh, topic of cults. So basically it's made uh, based on her theory. Mm -hmm. So afterwards I'll kind of take you through the video and then uh, we can discuss the different parts. But yeah, first let's look at it together. When Reverend Jim Jones founded the people in 1955, few could have imagined its horrifying end. This progressive religious movement rose in popularity and gained support from some of San Francisco's most prominent politicians. But in 1977, amidst revelations of brainwashing and abuse, Jones moved with several hundred followers to establish the commune of Jonestown in Guyana. Built as a utopian paradise, the colony was more like a prison camp. And when a congressional delegation arrived to investigate its conditions, Jones executed his final plan. On November 18, 1978, 909 men, women, and children died after being forced to drink poisoned Flavor-Aid. That grisly image has since been immortalized as shorthand slang for single-minded, cult-like thinking. They drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Today, there are thousands of cults around the world. It's important to note two things about them. First, not all cults are religious. Some are political, therapy-based, focused on self-improvement, or otherwise. And on the flip side, not all new religions are what we're referring to as cults. So what exactly defines our modern understanding of cults? And why do people join them? Broadly speaking, a cult is a group or movement with a shared commitment to a usually extreme ideology that's typically embodied in a charismatic leader. And while few turn out as deadly as Jonestown or Heaven's Gate, which ended in a mass suicide of 39 people in 1997, most cults share some basic characteristics. A typical cult requires a high level of commitment from its members and maintains a strict hierarchy separating unsuspecting supporters and recruits from the inner workings. It claims to provide answers to life's biggest questions through its doctrine, along with the required recipe for change that shapes a new member into a true believer. 
And most importantly, it uses both formal and informal systems of influence and control to keep members obedient, with little tolerance for internal disagreement or external scrutiny. You might wonder whether some of these descriptions might also apply to established religions. In fact, the word cultus originally described people who cultivated the worship of certain gods by performing rituals and maintaining temples. But in time, it came to mean excessive devotion. Many religions began as cults, but integrated into the fabric of the larger society as they grew. A modern cult, by contrast, separates its members from others. Rather than providing guidelines for members to live better lives, a cult seeks to directly control them, from personal and family relationships to financial assets and living arrangements. Cults also demand obedience to human leaders who tend to be highly persuasive people with authoritarian and narcissistic streaks motivated by money, <laughs> sex, and power, or all three. <laughs> While a cult leader uses personal charisma to attract initial followers, further expansion works like a pyramid scheme, with earlier members recruiting new ones. Cults are skilled at knowing whom to target, often focusing on those new to an area or who have recently undergone some personal or professional loss. Loneliness and a desire for meaning make one susceptible to friendly people offering community. <laughs> the process can be subtle, sometimes taking months to establish a relationship. In fact, more than two-thirds of cult members are recruited by a friend, family member, or co-worker whose invitations are harder to refuse. <laughs> Once in the cult, members are subjected to multiple forms of indoctrination. Some play on our natural inclination to mimic social behaviors or follow orders. Other methods may be more intense, using techniques of coercive persuasion involving guilt, shame, and fear. And in many cases, members may willingly submit out of desire to belong and to attain the promised rewards. The cult environment discourages critical thinking, making it hard to voice doubts when everyone around you is modeling absolute faith. The resulting internal conflict, known as cognitive dissonance, keeps you trapped, as each compromise makes it more painful to admit you've been deceived. And though most cults don't lead members to their death, they can still be harmful. By denying basic freedoms of thought, speech, and association, Cults stunt their members' psychological and emotional growth, a particular problem for children who are deprived of normal developmental activities and milestones. Nevertheless, many cult members eventually find a way out, whether through their own realizations, the help of family and friends, or when the cult falls apart due to external pressure or scandals. Many cults may be hard to identify, and for some, their beliefs, no matter how strange, are protected under religious freedom. But when their practices involve harassment, threats, illegal activities, or abuse, the law can intervene. Believing in something should not come at the cost of your family and friends. And if someone tells you to sacrifice your relationships or morality for the greater good, they're most likely exploiting you for their own. Where is the presentation? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was open. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, you could you can see why I kind of I really like this video <laughs> because <laughs> it says so much. It says so much about the culture we live in, um, where we come from, our current worldview. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to do is basically take this video as a base and 
destructure it. So uh, also adding some of the other readings um, that I found and basically defining what is a cult, char characteristics of cults, who are these cult leaders and other recruiters, so that who's the team, who's the, who's the group, who are the already existing supporters, uh, some potential targets, the process itself, and what happens when it all falls apart because this is the topics that, you know, they touched upon on the video. So, what is a cult? They defined it as, you know, modern understanding of cult. So this is how we modern people define it. As, you know, a shared commitment to usually extreme ideology, typically embodied in a charismatic leader. And then they went into saying that it's different from a religion. Um, and not all cults are religious. So now I'm asking you, what are some of the other examples of cults that you know? They've mentioned two, Heaven's Gate and uh, what is the other Night one? Night Town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scientology. Time. But that's religious, right? Well, I'm saying it can be religious, it just oh, doesn't okay, have yeah. to be. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh moved to my town when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. The red clothes and they poisoned the mayor. Some political parties mm -hmm. on the far left or the far right. Don't you know, Trump? Is it? He's a type of cult figure. The things that people are yeah. doing in his name. Well, I think in the alt right there are bands of this kind of, like the neo Nazis in a way, feel mm -hmm. like a cult. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> okay, but I found it interesting that original meaning stemmed from a very religious background. So when people cultivated worship of gods. And from then on, it kind of, now it means excessive devotion. So I, I really like this, it's, it's more than it should be. Um, so what they talk about is that they separate the members from the rest of the society. So it's a closed group following a specific leader. It's all controlled. The ideology is extreme and uh, dedication <coughs> is extreme. So what are some of the other characteristics that they mentioned? So one is the high level uh, of commitment, hierarchy, that one's like, okay. Only the leader knows what's happening and then maybe the second in command and the smaller group knows a bit more, but everybody else just follows the regular processes. And it should provide, at least that's what they say, kind of answers to life's questions, what life is all, a sense of meaning, something that we're all searching for. Um, and they also supposedly have a, a process, how to get people in, how to keep them in, and how to get the most out of them. And using formal and informal systems. Formal are usually um, different procedures that are written down, so it's kind of the law of the group and informal systems are mostly based on groups, so how you kind of conform to the group when your friends are watching you and you want to fit in. Um, cult leaders. Now, I'm not going to take it personally. <laughs> 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 I'm not to saying this today. I will take it personally. <laughs> so we can say, Grace, that you are charismatic. Yes, um, I'll take that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 I don't <want> to know. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the first quality that kind of pops up when you ask people what cult leaders are like. Um, but people always also say they are highly persuasive, obviously. Um, in the video it said they use their charisma to get the first followers and then they let the system take over. Mm. <laughs> so they just have a close group of lackeys and they do all of the jobs. Um, so obviously they have an author authoritarian personality and narcissistic streak, so it's all about them, always about them. And they're motivated either by money, by sex, by power, or, or all three. And uh, Raven, for example, mentioned some different types of powers that they could be using to get the people in. So first one is reward. So they are perceived to, maybe because they've prophesy something, that they are um, kind of, they have power to give that 
reward to those people. So everybody else will die, but you will survive. And I have this power. So if you follow me, you will survive as well. And that could be not just survival, but like if you anything. stick with me, you'll get rich. If you stick you'll with me, you'll have all of the girls. Enlightened. Exactly. Yeah. Anything. So they have that power. The other side of it is the coercion. So if you don't stick with me, you know, we'll take care of you. I mean, in a <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one is legitimacy. So basically, where you can see legitimacy is um, that this power already exists and is given to s from somewhere else. For example, you already have a cult leader, and then his son takes over, and the cult leader says he's the next messiah. Mm -hmm. Or you have. A, politic, a political leader who already has some power and say, this guy here, mm. he knows what he's talking about. So his power is kind of legitimate in a way. Maybe it's the queen who's following this leader. Mm. You know? I, I know um, <coughs> at one point it was Madonna who was following the Kabbalah and she said, yeah, this is it. So mm. they kind of had that legitimacy. Mm. Uh, expertise. So these are people with specific knowledge. So uh, they say, I have this knowledge, I met, um, I have direct connection to God or aliens, and I'm an expert in these things. And you don't, and nobody else is. So you're the, I'm the only person you can get, get this information from. Uh, it's actually closely linked to the power of information, but with the power of information, once you give this information away, <coughs> the power goes. <coughs> So with an expertise, you have this power of direct communication. And when I divulge uh, some information to you, now you have mm. this power of information. But you have to be very careful how much and when you give it away. Uh, referent, this is more like uh, power of personality and identity. So people identify with you. They want to be like you. So it's, it's very based on charisma. So these are all of the different powers that cult leaders are using, could be using. Sometimes it's just one, a lot of the times it's kind of a mixture of all of these things. Or maybe they could alternate them, like stick and carrot policy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is all kind of a play, it's a game. So the other recruiters. Um, the video mentions that it's kind of like a pyramid scheme. So the other recruiters un are converted, and then they work for the leader. They have to be very, very friendly. So one of the um, people that um, I did this with, so one of the students I was working uh, with, he's uh, a Mormon. And he said, this is actually what we do. We go around houses and we're super nice. We will always give you a hand. And when you join the Mormons, you are assigned a best friend. <laughs> this person, <laughs> this person is with you all the time. You, you, you know, you can call them. Um, they, when you're in a meeting, they will be there. They will share everything with you. It's like this close link. They want you to feel at home. So, and they also said that a lot of the recruiters are already, um, you know, have specific emotional links to the person they're trying to recruit. So they're either family or friends or coworkers. So people that you know already have um, this magnet. So um, you want to be with them. You want to be a part of their group. You already identify with them on some level. So you know it's easier to be pulled in in this way. Let's see if I have any other notes. Yeah, uh, so Lalich, um, so the, the person who d um, made this video, she uh, wrote a book and focused all of, a lot of her attention on these group processes that are taking part in cults, and she called it a bounded choice. So once you're in there, you kind of, you're interested, you're new, and they get you in there because you want to belong. It's hard to get out because it's like being in a cool group, you know? You've already made some uh, commitments and then you feel bad when you say no mm. and they're your friends. So the, the more you're in, uh, 
the more you can't get out. So it's like they said, it's harder to say no once you've made all of these commitments. You, you already identify with a group. If I'm not this group, who am I? You know, it, it's hard to get out. So they mentioned some potential targets. Um, so what do they say? People who are new to an area, uh, they've recently undergone personal or professional loss, so they're in this state in their life where they kind of need something, they're looking for something new, they know that maybe a part of their life is over, so a new stage should kind of begin. They could be lonely and they're definitely seeking for something, so they're seeking for meaning. Um, I think Dawson did also um, research on what type of people join cults. And maybe it's surprising, but he found that, that usually cult members are all better educated than average. Um, so university degree, at least. Um, they're younger, so they're in their mid-20s to mid-30s. They're upper middle class, very idealistic, come from very happy families, and I find this one very interesting. No experience in mature relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they measure that, but... <laughs> 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 okay. So, well, I, mean, yeah. I guess the thing is, <laughs> when you've been in a mature relationship, you've tested your boundaries of who you are. Mm. So, when you live in a community that's like a cult, I'll just give it. I live with the Harry Krishnas, and the Harry Krishnas. Most people think they're really happy, nice people, but actually they're a cult. And I can tell you many stories afterwards. But one of the things is that a lot of the people they recruited, they recruited them when they were like at university, when they were 20 years old, and then I'm meeting them, and they've been there for 10 years, and so they've never had real relationships, they didn't even know how to really use a cell phone, you know, like there's many things that are out of context. Mm. And so it's like they, they, they haven't been tested, so they haven't built any strength about mm. who their identity is. So they just can be so easily um, taken over. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that that's what's the, I mean, maybe I should contextualise why I asked you to talk about this. You, you can. Because it just might make some more sense. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not really about the arc, <laughs> but it's really about the, the idea of the wider cult and using um, Petra's research to think about how we're all indoctrinated within culture. You know, Please don't spoil it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> spoil presentation. Go on, go on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so maybe another example I'd like to give is um, I did uh, research in a community called Damanhur, and it's in northern part of Italy, and uh, it's a huge community. It has 600 people to a thousand sometimes, and they all live there in around the same area. They have I think 25 to 30 communities from 10 to 30 people living in that house or that uh, smaller community. So it's kind of like a federation. And when I, I, I was there for two months and I lived with them and I interacted with them. So I, I tried to live their daily life. And I found it very interesting because whenever I ask them, why did you join this community? And they have this esoteric belief system. So it's very structured, I would say it's it could even be said it's, it's a religion by itself. They say it's not, that it's spirituality, but it could be a religion. And they told me, you know, a, a lot of them, if not all of them, said, I, I was very, I was supposed to be technically very happy in my previous life. So I had a really, really good job. I got quite a lot of money. I had a nice apartment. I had a partner. Uh, I took very, very fancy vacations once to two times a year, and we went to Bali and everything. Um, and these people were. <laughs> she's she's yeah, ready to go. I want to go. Just going to take their previous ones. And they said uh, these people had, you know, jobs like they were lawyers and doctors and engineers. You know, so you know, obviously they had enough money to survive and they had status and said but there was something missing 
I didn't, you know, I've always felt like there, I achieved everything, you know, on the checklist, but I felt empty and there was no meaning to my life. And when they met this group, that group gave them meaning. So this ties back to the definition of the cult. It just provides some ideology, some sense of meaning of life that people are looking for. So maybe it's, uh, people think it's usually naive young people who join cults. Maybe stereotypically we would even think they're not educated at all. They come from very, very poor backgrounds, um, you know, broken families, but it's not true. They actually did you know, did the whole step ladder thing, they did their checklist, but there was something missing, so I found that very interesting. So yeah, it's not as clear cut. So, indoctrination process. And I think I have a note here. Yeah, Lalic said that she actually um, divides this whole process into two. So first is the conversion process, and then the commitment. So first you, get, you have to get people in, and then you have to keep people in. And the, the first process, so the conversion, kind of demands a shift in worldview. So demands you to, um, you have to start looking at the world through different glasses. You have to start valuing different things. And this is something she considers very, very dangerous. Um, and she, in the video, they said that it, it can be very subtle and it can take a long, long time. And they give the example of, you know, it's, uh, kind people coming in, you're, you're feeling lost, they're giving you a hand, you know, oh, let's go here and maybe I'll introduce you to my group so you won't feel alone. So it takes a lot of time to build. And you have multiple uh, different forms of uh, this indoctrination process. So the first one here is natural uh, inclination to mimic social behavior. So this is more group-based. So when we're in a group, we kind of want to conform. You're walking past the group, and they're laughing, and you're like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you really know what the joke was about? No. You just, uh, well, I, do, I, I did that yesterday. I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one and it's yeah it happens all the time um, and then the other one is using different techniques of coercion and persuasion using guilt and shame so this is kind of more coming from the leader usually but also from the others because if you don't you know submit other people are who do you think you are you didn't r ring the gong <laughs> didn't we agree that the gong was supposed to be right <laughs> So, oh, <laughs> for example, you know, maybe they have these examples in the <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point here is, is we, we all have this willing submission, you know, we want to submit because we want to belong to, to some degree. Um, so direct control from, uh, so yeah, in time, all of this, pro when they really get you in, the point is, that's what they say in the video, is to get, you know, on, to, um, to kind of cut you off from all of the personal connections and to get all of your money. So this is, that, this is what they say is the end process. It's to really drain you as a human being. Yeah, what does that mean about us, where we just walked in and turned over everything, like our phones? So you didn't contact. even make it hard. Yeah. So that, that's yeah, the that, point. That came first here. <laughs> yeah, that comes first. I don't really care about your family relationship. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> what? No. <laughs> we cannot contact them, so. Oh, yeah. You've isolated us, Grace. Um, so um, there's this uh, Laughland and Stark, for example, they've um, done some research and this would be like the first um, process of conversion, so the first step, how to convert people. Um, and they said first, you have to have, you have to be in this time of your life when there's something missing and there's this tension. Maybe you've lost somebody, maybe you've lost a job, maybe you've just finished school and you don't know what to do. Maybe you're in a, in a new town, so you're lost and there's this, what they, a cult 
you you feel these tensions acutely. So, and they also say you have to be kind of willing to, you know, for this issue to be solved through a religious perspective. So it doesn't have to be, you know, something physical. You 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 kind of become a religious seeker. So you you become this explorer of new things. So I'm thrown into this new situation, and but I'm an explorer. Uh, I don't have to, I cannot go back to how it was before, so I will explore some things and find a new way. Um, so in this, kind of in this phase of your life is where you should technically encounter this group that indoctrinates you. So people are supposed to spot you, you know, offer you some friendly advice, um, be there for you, so this is where the nice people step in. Um, and they help you create this effective bond with them, a friendship. Um, it can, uh, it can pre-exist before and it just becomes stronger, but this is where it starts. And you're supposed to become so attached to these people that you s forget about others. So you're like, oh, this is my best friend. You know, they are actually there for me. While all of the other friends, they don't give a shit. I was depressed. Um, you know, I was looking for something. What were they doing? You know, they were looking after their own self. And once you're in, uh, they're supposed to, you know, really intensify that exposure to the people already inside. And I think a couple of years later, they revised. So the two authors revised these steps, and they said technically, the first four steps are actually not that important is the, the last three steps that are key. So it's the effective bond, and this is what the Mormons are doing. So this is it. Just focus on us, we're the nice ones, and you know, we will be there for you, with you, long term. You don't need anybody else. Sue, did I have? Oh yeah before I go on to this, but uh, then Lalic said something about social dynamics in cults, so this is not it. Um, I don't want to go back, should I go back? Oh. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think this kind of deals more with the commitment, so how to make people stay, not just get them in, but to help them stay. And she said that, you know, there has to be this charismatic authority throughout. And there has, uh, this group has to have like a transcendent belief system. So it has to include stories of the past, the present, and the future, and where we belong and what we're doing. So it has to have this ideology, um, this creation myth, and the future, maybe not necessarily a prophecy, but kind of where we're going and what, where we want to go. And then they have the two systems of control we already mentioned. So first is the written rules, how we're supposed to behave. And the, s the second one is the informal influences. So the other group members will make sure that you conform. And you will make sure the other group members conform. It doesn't work one way only. Once you're a part of the group, the group controls itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they did... Um, punishments um, in Middle Ages, you know, they made sure that they punished people in the public square and it wasn't the punishment itself that mattered. Mm. It was you there mm. being known and being seen by everybody. Think like this person, he's a rule breaker. <laughs> so what, what kind of effect that had it was, uh, it was, I mean, phenomenal. So people not only felt physically punished, but the emotional and psychological punishment was even greater. And it also worked on the outside. So when you saw a person being punished, and you saw this, and you participated in this punishment, people threw mm -hmm. like tomatoes and everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you also, um, like, as an outsider, you knew you definitely didn't want to do mm. that. Mm. Mm. So th this is kind of the informal social control, mm. is that psychological um, effect. 
so what happens when prophecy fails? So a lot of cults have this prophecy. So what's going to happen in the future? And um, the, um, the video mentions that you know cults demand obedience and they discourage critical thinking. And it's actually, it makes it hard for everybody to voice anything that is in contrast with what the group believes in. And this can be harmful. But what happens when you know we say the world is going to end on March 21st, 2016, and that doesn't happen? Um, I think it's, yeah, Dawson <coughs> says that, you know, cults have these adaption strategies. <laughs> so <laughs> so th th they can, they can adapt to that. So they can start converting other people intensely. So it, it's kind of, we were uh, discussing with Margaret this yesterday. And, um, you know, what, they, it kind of, it's, it's based on this whole, um, premise that misery loves company. So, you know, if I fell for this and I don't want to admit I was wrong because that creates this tension within me because of cognitive dissonance, if I convert other people, then if I manage to do that and get a bigger group, how can we all be wrong? Mm -hmm. So it's, it kind of gives you this little cushion. It's actually the one I understand the least, uh, but okay. When, meaning that when you're feeling doubt, you actually Absolutely. feel the impulse to go grab some more, more people, people exactly to prove to yourself that, that you were great. right. Yeah, that you were right all along because these people you also almost mimic it. the charisma of the leader. Yeah, at that point here. <laughs> <laughs> I said if you're already yeah. invested in like yes. that, like a belief, then like if you think that like you're right, then like it's really hard to like admit that you were wrong, wrong so it's exactly. much easier like trying to com like combat other people <laughs> exactly <laughs> you're really converting yourself exactly again again. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But the leader the leader doesn't have now he's he's very sure mm -hmm. yeah. yeah does the leader so know that, yeah. <coughs> oh, well, <laughs> we're going to <laughs> could be or yeah. not but so one is um no, the other one is rationalization and it has four sub um uh, strategies and I, I didn't do that very well but the first one is spiritualization so what they say is you know that end of the world we were expecting to manifest in physical reality it actually manifested in spiritual mm. <laughs> yeah. um yeah, that one that one well, that's kind of like 2012 exactly yeah, yeah. World. yeah. December 21st that was Exactly. Right, which is a Mayan prophecy. But the Mayans didn't actually say it would happen in physical reality. Just the New Age yeah. said it would happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and obviously it didn't happen yeah. otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. <laughs> so it, and it happened in quite a lot of groups and they had this meditation and the, they felt like, you know, they, they checked their watches and it was past the time. And they're like, okay, but did you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there's always a group of people who said, yeah, I did. It was so intense. Um, and it, it, it <laughs> so you kind of feel stupid if you didn't feel it. It's like maybe, you know, you're just not sensitive enough. It's okay. But you have us, you know. We know that we are better now. It's, it's shifted. And this is like a prime opportunity also for the cult to re reorganize themselves. So the, the second one is the test of faith. So they say, actually, this was just a test of faith. <laughs> we really wanted to see if you were you know, faithful to this cult, to this um, group. And um, that was it. Now we know. And you're in. <laughs> you're definitely in now. <laughs> uh, the other one is human error. So it's always about blaming another person so either there were some miscalculations made because we were looking at these old texts and they didn't account for you know it's a different calendar <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> or you know it was that specific person who did that in the group who did that last week and he jinxed us so now we he basically you know <laughs> made it so <laughs> 
No, no, we, we can <laughs> have this <laughs> prophecy <laughs> come true. <laughs> it was the translation, the translation in the Bible, you know, it was originally in Greek. Exactly, and Hebrew, and exactly. And, made something and it was completely <laughs> misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. they didn't make the math yeah. properly with <laughs> seven, seven, six, six, six. And exactly, <laughs> because <laughs> humans were not perfect. We make errors. Right. So it's okay. We believe this, you know, would happen. And, but we forgot that, you know, we're not divine. Um, <laughs> wow. So, yeah, this happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, blaming others is basically, yeah, blaming the, that other person in the group who, you know, caused this. And the other one is reaffirmation. So this is technically an opportunity. It, it ties very well with maybe um, spiritualization or test of faith. So this is kind of an opportunity that we restructure ourselves, that we make ourselves stronger. This was just a you know, rite of passage. Now we are better. We have reached a new level. So, but it really depends on um, if these strategies work uh, because there are different conditions that influence the flow and uh, effectiveness of them. So uh, Dawson mentions um, level of in-group uh, social support. So if you have a group that, you know, they know each other very well, they're very good friends, they're supportive, they, it's more likely that especially the more um, group-based strategies will work. So if somebody says that, oh, did you feel, you know, it, it happened on a spiritual level, and you're very close to that person, you're like, yeah, I, I believe you. Yeah. It did. Um, decisive leadership. So if the leader doesn't falter, they have to be quick to react. Um, so the, it, the, the communication system has to be very quick as well. So it has to come from him directly to everybody else. So the, the less time it takes, the better. So you, you're not, you can't let other uh, people have time to think of other things. You're supposed to be there to provide an explanation immediately uh, or as quickly as possible. Um, scope and sophistication of ideology. So ideology has to be concrete but not that concrete. So it kind of allows um, reinterpretation in time. Uh, pre presence of ritual framing. So you're supposed to kind of, if it's the end of the world you're preparing for, it's kind of a ritual that you always need, that you think about how it's going to be, how we're going to ascend. So if you have this ritual going on, and after the event happens, you have to create another ritual. So it's keeping that ritual in place, and having that ritual beforehand, it makes it easier for things not to fall apart. Uh, vagueness of prophecy, so it goes with the sophistication of ideology. So the, it has to be vague enough, but not too vague. <laughs> Is that nice uh, medium? And uh, yeah, my question with this, it seems like there's a lot of dates, or like at this time, if you don't have something concrete mm. enough, exactly, a prophecy could fall. It's not like I think about awakening or enlightenment. Mm that it, you know at any point it could be happening to us that's a really strong one but there isn't this tie to exactly um march 12th in five years exactly which gives people this feeling of okay. like doing pull a chin up i can do it a little longer exactly yeah because if you can use about a date it's based on what human beings can achieve right whereas if it's enlightened one it's not <laughs> you become enlightened is not your choice Right. It's something happening to you. Right. It's got nothing to do with you. You become enlightened a lot. You know what I mean? Like Buddha, let's say he was enlightened. He, he said, I'm not going to move until I become enlightened, but he didn't know how long that would be. Right. So it's, it's like something that's happening to you rather than you saying, oh, I'm going to do it by a certain date. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So the last one is, so organizational factors. Dawson admits that obviously there are some other factors that could you know, influence the adaption strategies and that could, but they haven't been researched that thoroughly yet, but he admits you know, there are obviously 
things like the size of the cold, how close they are, um, how they communicate with each other and the people outside. So there are also some other things that we have to take into account. But sometimes colds end. And uh, the video says, <laughs> finally, um, that, you know, uh, it could be a consequence of, uh, you know, a fatal prophe prophecy. Um, and maybe the strategies were not utilized effectively. So it, it could fall uh, because of that. But sometimes, uh, well, as the video mentions, it can kind of come from a heroic action. That's how they framed it. Either it's people who realize by themselves how wrong they were and they exit. Or it's the family and friends that get you and rescue you from this cult. Or it even falls apart because of some external pressures. So from the poli uh, political um, attacks, from uh, you know, something happening. Mm -hmm. So it's the outside, the critical outside, that has saved you. Thank God. Um, so they also said it's kind of hard to identify because the cults now, especially the uh, religious ones, are protected um, under the religious freedom. And um, only when you know there's some very, very um, criminal things happening, like harassment, threat, or other illegal activities, that's when the police comes in. So another hero can rescue you. So, but, um, <laughs> so yeah. That, that's why I like this, because it's um, one of the, the things I'm really interested in generally is the worldview. And I come from a background of social constructionism. So I see that you know, reality is as we create it and uh, rea as we believe it. So to really, really be critical of it, we have to criticize our own perspective. And w when I saw this, uh, video and the person who showed it to me so the student he was like you know this is really great i really liked it it was very concise it was perfect I'm like, mm -hmm. but it's also very very in line with the current ideology so this is exactly how the current society thinks exactly and they made it into a cartoon and you had a hero and you have all of these cults and all of these murders and suicides. It was like <laughs> perfect. <laughs> exactly. And funny. And it was funny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly to us, actually. <laughs> so in order to think more holistically and more critically, I tried to utilize some of the theories and maybe this is going to be a like complete overload, so I, I apologize in advance. So I started thinking about the balance of power and the fractal theory. I'm going to go into uh, it a bit um, further later on. Um, and cults as the other. Um, and here I, I kind of used uh, Jung's interpretation of the shadow as a projection of onto the other. And I thought about minority influence from the socio-psychological um, background. So yeah, it's quite a lot of things that I'm going to throw at you right now. Um, but I'm going to try to be like very, very short. So one is this, I like this thing of balance. Maybe I've been exposed to this Eastern um, influences a bit too much because it's like this yin and the yang and you have to find something in between and all is okay but really depends on the situation and you have to be flexible and aristotle said that there, there is this golden mean there is this like perfect balance in everything and if we apply it to power you know it can be slave versus master so you're not a slave and you're not a master but you're somewhere in between so finding this in between phase where you, you're free, but you're also not, you know, ruling over people excessively. This is kind of this balance that we're trying to find in life constantly. Um, and I think Hobbes said that, you know, if we were all to be free and be masters, that life would be really nasty and brutish 
and short. <laughs> so we need this social contract and we need, you know, a social control for, you know, us not to just go around killing each other because we stole each other's carrot. Um, so there is this <laughs> need for balance. And, you know, currently the values um, in our postmodern society, have I, have I made? So, and I kind of want to tie it into the Anthropocene mm -hmm. from yesterday uh, because it's kind of where it all started, I think, with this whole colonialism and globalization because we are independent and we are researchers and we're explorers and we are free and heroic and individualistic and we're critical thinkers. We don't follow, we lead. So it, it kind of, we are based in this uh, kind of worldview, and you could see that in the video very clearly, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, th this is one thing that I kind of had on my mind when I was watching the video. Um, and the other one is fractals. And I kind of like to, you know, there's this, um, what do you call it? Shit. I forgot. Um, the, the law, as above, so below as within, so without. Mm -hmm. And this goes very well with the fractal theory. So what fractals are, are these, um, is the geometries in nature. So we can find these basic patterns everywhere in nature and at any scale. And it seems like they're all kind of connected in a way. So we can find them in plants, um, trees, rivers, and even organizations. Um, so you, we tend to think in our, our worldview that everything happens top down, but technically it works both ways because everything is a reflection of everything else. So actually the whole, the bigger picture is a construct of many, many, many different and interactive patterns. So if we look at these patterns, we can see the whole in that small pattern. Um, and I really liked it because some people did research and tried to compare these patterns and they found these same patterns in the structure of the universe and the wireless communications and you know the brain and the human body and the stock market prices but the, my favorite favorite one somebody kind of managed to link it to delivering cement in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was somebody's re research. I, I didn't really, uh, I, I'll have to get the source, but yeah. Uh, some people study ants, the movement of ants, the path they follow up, and bees flying and so on using the fractal dimension. They even can't exactly. it. But, and this is it. This is in natural sciences. You see it, and mm -hmm. it's everywhere. And for, the really, for delivering cement, it makes sense. I guess. <laughs> started in natural but once we take this you know as inspiration to try looking at the social world from this perspective it kind of opens up a lot of different possibilities maybe not you know provide answers because not to think no two two things are the same but just the pattern is similar so it's it kind of opens the door to something new something potential and for example yesterday we mentioned the the queer theory and how it looked at plastics, and we're, we asked why, 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 why queer theory and plastics, how did, did these two things relate? But they said, you know, in our small universe, we saw this happening, and we saw it reflected in the bigger universe. And this is it, this was this connection of the fractal and the queer community and the queer theory reflected in the bigger issue of environmentalism. So I, I really like that. So you, you can, we, we can find these things everywhere. So, so this is one, fractals. Um, and the other one is there's also another perspective that actually cult leaders aren't anything special. And it's a situational perspective that there can be a moment in time where anybody can become a cult leader. <laughs> Be the best cult leader you can be. be. Exactly. <laughs> so yes, they are special in that moment in time, but maybe, you know, next Wednesday is going to be you. Maybe in 70 years it's going to be, you know, your grandchild. Who knows? It's anybody. So this is also one theory that I kind of really like. Um, 
And then the other one, why if, I was thinking, if they are actually the reflection of the whole society, cults, if we're looking at them as fractals and at what we can learn, why do we see them in this modern, postmodern culture as something evil, something bad, something to fight against? Why? Why are they, you know, the other? You know, and you can see this um, kind of labeling of the other in many different um, parts of life. For example, for men, the other is the woman. And sorry to say, but you know, the woman, uh, also in modern, um, postmodern culture, she's the, the irrational one, the emotional one, the soft one, is the other, because our society is strong and active, and we can, you know, we're, we take what we want. So the woman is this sexualized, soft, um, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. it's the other that the culture is not. And for example, um, when you have um, foreigners coming into your country and you think the other, yeah. Now they're gonna come here and they're going to take all of our benefits and they're so lazy, they're not gonna work. I know they're not gonna work. So the other, we are hardworking and they are the lazy. So we keep projecting the other part onto the other group and it's completely natural. As a group, it depends on which group you belong. You know, what women do is like the men are stupid. You know, I have to say now take the, the opposite. <laughs> so <laughs> <not> <laughs> <that>. um, <laughs> God, they're so stupid. You know, they just don't get it, and they're so single-minded, and they just like think of one thing at a time, and they can't see the bigger picture and the interconnectedness of everything. So yeah, stupid men. Um, so this is kind of the the projection of the other. So. I really like this, um, let me see if I made some, um, oh yeah, and uh, yesterday we talked about the stranger danger. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's the, it's the other, you know, yeah. it's the strangers that they're going to attack you. It's the strangers that are going to kidnap you and rape you and take you away. But you know, statistically, most rapes and murders happen inside the family. Mm -hmm. But no, no, it's the other that's going to kill you and damage you. So. It's all a projection outside. So in kind of Jungian psychology and so, some other interpretations of it, um, I heard somewhere that, I don't know who actually said it, but they, they said that we're born with holding all of our cards. And once we are born into a specific culture and identify with some values, we drop or hide some of our cards mm -hmm. because they're not the light. So we are born and when the light shines on us, we, we look towards the light, towards that ideal that we want to be. Um, it can be cultural ideal, a personal ideal, and we are that ideal. So once we turn towards the light, the shadow is cast behind us mm -hmm. and all of that we were complete before one is lit and the other one is hidden. Mm. So we don't want to talk about that part of us even though it is a part of us. Um, so in yesterday we mentioned about this creative attention uh, and paying attention to what's not being exposed and what's not there. So I think this is kind of like another way to have this creative attention to see what is not there. What is actually is there, but we're not saying it because it's in our shadow and we don't want to admit that we have it, you know, that it's actually us or the rapers mm -hmm. um, and the kidnappers and the murderers and, you know, but we're sometimes we're not a hero at all. Uh, and we're sometimes not rational and we're not strong um, and we can be victims. So it's something that we don't want to admit, but we have. So. So this is one that I was thinking why cults can be um, demonized in a way because they show us a thing that we don't want to see. They show us people that um, follow something emotional, something spiritual that our rational society does not want us to follow because we're ra we don't need God. You know, we have statistics. 
and we can predict. Why? I mean, we know, we, we can create things. You know, we can genetically engineer a lot of things. We are, we, we are above God. And we're not some weird, uh, you know, emotional feeling people. We laugh at those people. That's the funny clothes they wear. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, what else did I... So, minor in minority influence, for example, um, you have this, obviously, the majority who's influencing you, what we talked about before, but there's also some instances when there's a vocal minority that kind of manages to change the majority. And I don't know if you've seen... To yeah. <laughs> 12 Angry Men is a great movie. It's like it, it takes uh, place in um, the jury, so it all in one room, and how one person can convince the whole jury. So this is kind of what minority influence is. And the majority has strategies in place to protect themselves from minorities like this. Because you don't want, you know, it's... It's not structured. We, we want stability. So if we constantly have one person coming in and changing everything, it's, it's not going to work. You know, we need to find this balance. So what the majority does, it's kind of, they demonize the minority. It's like, oh, it's that guy, you know. He's crazy, he's stupid. Um, he's just saying these things, but they're not really true. And you know, on weekends, he eats babies and you know, it's <laughs> I mean, the stories that I've heard, um, and I stayed in that uh, community in Italy, and they, had, they told me, you know, I, I work with people, you know, who are not a part of the community, and they told, tell me and, and ask me, so you live there? But don't you, you know, practice like black magic and eat babies? Is that really? <laughs> but th this is, you know, this is true. And um, the community Grace and I met in, um, you know, there was the story going yeah, around. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> the story <laughs> was. <laughs> she liked I'm this one even more. Though. The story was that we all sleep in one big round bed oh, yeah. in the attic. Did you hear that story? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and do you? No. Um, she wants that and the bully ticket. <laughs> <laughs> So, looking at all of this, let me just see how much time. Fuck, we don't have enough. Yes, yes, yes. Um, see, I'm, I'm making some space so people can contribute. So, um, <laughs> so let's have another look at what's been said and try to look at it from a different perspective. Um, so they said, what is a cult? And they say, it's, this is per verbatim. So I, I transcribed this per verbatim from the video. Usually extreme ideology. You know, we are, we are normal. We are basic, and those guys, they're completely extreme. They don't belong into this normality of our society. And um, they said that cults are also political and therapy-based and focus on self-improvement, but they only mentioned two cults, and they were all religious cults. Mm -hmm. And I checked her book, uh, so this uh, Lalich, um, and she mentions 10 examples of cults, and eight of them are religious, and two of them are political, and they're political mostly from a Marxist communist perspective, <laughs> which is a very, very um, typical other um, in our society. So, um, what did I say? So, um, excessive devotion. So we are rational, and we think, so we, d we don't go into excessive devotion. Um, and they're supposed to tell you how to live a better life, but they're not doing that. You know, we know what a better life is. And I really like this article from Beckford, and he says that... Um, oh, yeah, I have this... So, um, he says that actually uh, public is very anxious um, towards cults because... Um, they, um, hmm, how did I frame this? Um, so they see them as very morally questionable, but at the same time, when we're confronted with very similar stories from established religions, we kind of sweep that under the, the rug.
So yeah, the stories we heard about the Catholics um, and the pedophilia and stuff like that, when stuff like that happens in already established religions, it's not as bad if it happens like in a smaller yes. community. So we're more um, anxious about these smaller, weird things uh, that are not part of the mainstream. Um, and the, he says that the animosity is there even before anything bad happens. So, um, and he kind of lists three types of um, uh, kind of con controversies. Um, and the first one is massification and demonization. So it's kind of weird because when people go into a cult, they don't conform to the normal prescription of what a successful life is. So by going there, um, they say that all of these stages, all of those lists, don't matter. And they are not successfully initiated into the normal culture. And that kind of gives the, the normal cu culture this impression, is there something wrong with me? Why are you not following this? You know? Mm -hmm. So the second one is, um, because they're challenging, and I'm, I quote this, uh, colonization of the life world by the system. So it goes very well with what I've just said. So they, 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 they d disagree. And it's very easy to do this, especially in um, cults where you kind of focus on religious or spiritual issues. Um, and uh, communication specifically today is very uh, widespread. So it's very quick and very easy to hear all of these stories. And secularization, polarization, he said, well, religion specifically is going to be very, very um, targeted because it's, even though it's kind of accepted to be a religious person, at the same time it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, we accept the, the religions because they conform to a specific status quo, but at the same time, it's, we're still atheists, normally, or rational. So, characteristics of the cult, they demand commitment, answer to all of the questions, and have different systems of social control. But this happens everywhere. It happens in businesses. It happens in high school with the little social groups with the popular kids. You know, the, the commitment that they demand uh, and the, the systems that they have in place. Uh, brands, for example, you can't own an, uh, an Apple thing just separately. If you want to connect it to anything else, everything has to be an Apple mm -hmm. product. So that's the commitment. And answering life's biggest questions, you know, everything answers life's biggest mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. now yeah. with the commercials yeah, sure. and you have this handsome guy with this girl, you know, all you have to do is buy this um, deodorant and your <laughs> life will be um, perfect. So cult leaders, they say they're motivated by money, sex, power, and all three, but actually, we're all motivated by <laughs> <laughs> all three. Um, and I mean, we all utilize different bases of power. Currently, I'm trying to utilize my power of expertise and hiding all of the things I don't know, so I seem smart. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and for yeah, these are the experts, these are the popular and attractive communicators. They're very influential. And I'm trying to speak fast, so because if I speak fast, statistically, I'm also more influential. Um, wow. Statistically, no. I know I'm not fast because I'm over time. So, uh, and I mean, we've seen a lot of different, uh, they're very popular experiments in the obedience to authority. I mean, this doesn't happen only in cults. For example, Milgram's experiment with the shocks. People shocked, they, they thought they killed people because a doctor there told them to do it and they follow orders. Was it a cult? It was a doctor. It, they were students, they were there, they saw this doctor. There wasn't even a doctor. What was the Milgram experiment? So um, they, they made this experiment to see how far people will go yeah. following orders and they didn't tell them that. Yeah. Um, so they had two groups of people, they said it's two groups of people. You were assigned to one group mm -hmm. and you wanted, um, you were the teacher and the other person on the other side was the student. Mm -hmm. 
So I, as the doctor, I, I wore a robe and I give you these rules. Um, you have to shock them every time they make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if they make the same mistake twice, the shock goes up. So mm -hmm. every time they make a mistake, there's a bigger shock that you mm -hmm. have to administer. And this is, it's written mm -hmm. very formally. Mm -hmm. This is what you have to do. And I'm there standing behind you mm -hmm. to make sure you do yeah. it. And I think the last five shocks or something like that were like lethal. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last one, it'd be dead. Yeah. Um, so there were the, the person on the other side was a, you know, he, he was one of the, the researchers. Mm -hmm. And obviously they made mistakes. Because that's a, yeah, exactly, that was planned. Um, and people shot them mm. and they killed them. A lot of, I think 30% or so killed the person on the other side. They, mm -hmm. That person, the informant on the other side was screaming mm. and then suddenly they just went quiet. And they're like, you still have to push the button. <laughs> and they did it. So we follow orders very well. Um, <laughs> no, no. Ah. <laughs> are, are you wearing a white coat? <laughs> no. no. So other recruiters, we talked a lot about, um, you know, groups and how just the implied presence of other people kind of want us to conform and they make us act differently. Um, and we want to be like certain members of certain groups, M maybe even if we're students, we want to, we identify as the professors. So we conform to the rules of professors because that's where we want to be. Um, so yeah, there's constantly, I'm not even going to go into it, but there's these processes of compliance and conversion are constantly present everywhere, all the time. Um, and yeah, it goes uh, very tightly with identity theories. We all want to belong and we all identify with being something. So it goes. We, we identify with a certain aspect of the light and we don't want to hear anything else. So the potential targets. So who conforms? Generally, uh, yeah, intelligent people conform. Uh, people who uh, have, it's like inverted u curve. So they say mostly unintelligent people and stupid people they thought conform, but no. It's normal people who conform. So if they're too stupid and too unintelligent or too intelligent, they won't, as if they're completely in the middle. So that's the majority, actually. Um, then we have the cognitive bias. I love this one, the third person effect. People who say that they don't, that they won't conform, they're more likely to conform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they don't admit that part. Mm -hmm. that it's that conform, shadow exactly. question again. So they say that women conform more, but it goes well with uh, women are more social, so they're more in social groups, so it's, it's a situational perspective. Um, so yeah, uh, high anxiety, a lot of the, the, the bottom ones uh, deal with the specific period in our lives where we feel um, that we need something else, that we, we need to transition into something different. So obviously we conform because we're looking to identify with a different light. So we're just looking, we're constantly evolving. Uh, direct control, so from personal, okay, what did I say here? Uh, persuasion is a series of steps, it always has been. So there are different tactics of compliance people in media um, utilize, people in advertising. Um, so just people selling door to door, you know, uh, they, they want to make, uh, you like them or they want uh, they give you a small gift so you would feel obliged to give something back um, that's the reciprocity and sometimes they use guilt uh, I love the foot in the door technique so that's kind of like they ask you for something small and it could be like oh do you mind putting this sticker on your window and when you agree to that they ask for something bigger which is related to the small one so you already identified with this issue by putting the sticker, but it was nothing. Mm -hmm. But they ask you now to put up a board in your backyard. And I think about 60% of people say yes, because they feel that they have to. It's, mm -hmm. It creates cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. So during the face tactic is very similar, but they, want, they ask something that they know that they're not going to get. So you'll feel bad. And then they'll ask something they really want, and you'll 
given that. A uh, lowball tactic is basically just making you agree to something before you really know what it's really about. So just giving you like the positive things and then you already kind of signed the contract. And they're like, oh yeah, PS, the small print. Because <laughs> that goes very well with mindlessness. Um, and I, in identity theory, action research, uh, they found out that people who work together in a group and they kind of uh, talk about the product uh, in a group so it's not delivered by somebody else, uh, they, they love it more because it's more personal. Uh, when prophecy fails, again, critical thinking, but you know, this happens all the time. We, it's about cognitive dissonance. So we will use all of these strategies. And even Dawson said, actually, when we're looking at adaptation strategies and all of the influencing conditions, it's better not to focus only on cults because, um, what, what does he say? He basically says, um, it's better to focus on a uh, broader, broader, more generic processes of dissonance management in various religious and other social groups. So he admitted that this is not, you know, uh, unique, unique to cults. It's yeah, to better understand it, let, let's look at all of the other groups there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he admitted it's not a cult thing; it's any other thing. It happens with politicians where they fail yeah. to follow their programs. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and can be harmful. I, I just like that one uh, because it says that if, peop um, if children are kind of uh, trapped in that cult mentality, that can be really harmful because they don't have enough um, contact with the outside world. And we talked about children yesterday mm -hmm. and how it is that now they're not even allowed to, to go out in mm -hmm. the same manner that they were you know, uh, decades before. So it's the same mentality. We're doing the same thing to our children on a daily basis. Um, so, and here it's, it's very good example of how they're demonized. You know, they, they can be hard to identify. You never know, it's a witch hunt. You know, damn religious freedom. But don't worry, we'll look out for them. And when they harass <laughs> people and threat people, uh, we're, we're going to get them. Um, so, that's it, yeah, public, uh, um, that's what we talked about before. How, how do you see this in relation to the bigger context then? Because, you know, in terms of just recently, you know, with all the elections that's been going on, Trump, Brexit, in France, Le Pen, the, the mass indoctrination of the far right, mm. how easy these strategies have been played. Mm -hmm. You know, the cult-like, you, you, yeah. you've seen it. Yeah. Th that's what I'm saying. It's completely natural to occur, and it is occurring in everyday life. And all we need to do is try to be conscious of it, you know, not to deny that this is our tendency. It's our tendency to conform, because we want to be part of the group. So you're saying cults are a good thing? I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. Uh, it's or I'm interpreting what you're saying as just the fact that we're so afraid of cults because it shows us what already happens in it, our larger exactly. society. Exactly. So we just don't condemn it as that. And I but kind I, of, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, but yeah, I see the cognitive dissonance happening in terms of the far right movement too, of yeah. having certain beliefs in those then not being okay. about and reacting. So I don't want to go into lessons learned because that, that's what the discussion is for. Mm. And this, these are my lessons learned, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And how, how do you think we can protect ourselves better? Or is that to do the lessons learned? Um, you yeah, I, I would really like to hear back from you. What, 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 what did you get from this? Well, we've got ten minutes yeah. until lunch, but we can continue after yeah. lunch, obviously. Yeah. Um, I have three questions for the moment. For the moment, afterwards I don't know. Where. <laughs> One: How do you cope with the with the? Uh, I mean, it is very clear. I am wondering how clear such a such a diffuse topic has been studied. How do you define or? It, I think there is a gradient of groups and human Definitely. behaviors and so on. Let me ask you two groups I consider just as a reference mm -hmm.
for this discussion. One is rat packs. Groups of people where everyone is a potential cult leader and then they start, you know, that's an extreme. Mm. I mean, it is not a case of a one charismatic or whatever leader and the others are being, no, 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 it's a rat pack. In Spanish, we call it a, a bowl filled of crickets. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time. The second are sports clubs, particularly basketball and football, soccer clubs, where the uh, leadership is diffused and shared. There is still a leader, there is a manager, but what is occurring inside is shared somehow, and the protagonism is given to the other when giving the ball to the other, and there is no time to, for complaining too much on errors made by someone. And the third, uh, the question is a professional question. How do you cope with the difficulties of defining why, where, where, which one of these so many different groups of people or whatever is effectively a cult? That, that's what I think. I mean, what I got from this is that we define the cult is just the label for the other. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you have this continuum of groups, and you can, you know, the, the other can also be a commune. You know, any weird label or a conspiracy theorist is just somebody who's not agreeing with you. So I don't even. When I talk about um, eco-villages and sustainable communities with other people, the first thing that they ask me, oh, so it's, it's a cult, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it because it's a label. And this is just a label given to things that are the other, that you don't, that represent something the opposite. But technically it's, it's a continuum and we constantly move in that continuum all the time. And we don't belong to just one group. We belong to multiple groups. And sometimes you're the leader. Sometimes it's a leaderless group. And it, it's so fluid that I think, thinking critically of social sciences, they're trying too hard to define things because they want to move closer to the natural sciences when things were defined with cells. But the natural sciences are figuring out now that everything is actually interconnected anyway. So it's really hard to study or heal a person just by focusing on one part of their body because it's, it's all connected. So it, it's the same thing. It's hard to isolate something or define something because it constantly moves. It's, it's a natural organism. I mean but nevertheless, you are doing it and you are doing <laughs> it successfully. I mean, fairly okay. How? <laughs> <laughs> For, so, for a science focusing on such a diffuse thing, I mean, being a ecologist, physicist, and, and, uh, and so on is much easier, yeah? You are studying something really fluid. How, is, is, is it something intuitive, or, or, or how do you cope with it? Uh, personally, I don't want to define things, and I'm very hated in social sciences. Because, and that's why I'm interested in the fractal theory and um, the Taurus model, because it's something moving, it's something 4D, it's something that I can relate to this chaotic uh, situation that, you know, social life is. But frankly, you know, also natural life is like that. And I love that, that finally now it's, it's clear that also natural life is completely hectic. Thank God. Sorry, I yeah. think in terms of our performance, you know, our protest performance, and we'll be like a little group going out into the mm. world. So we're in a sense the other. Yeah. You know, and or we're all there the other. Like how do you think will we be persuading people you know, mm. we're gonna give yeah, people yeah. leaflets to come to the barbecue, like will we be playing with tactics like that or how will we protect ourselves from also being judged as being weird. Mm. I mean, obviously we're wearing costumes, yeah. but how are we going mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. to think about that you know, yeah. in terms of how our bonding, um, you know, like not just in the terms of like physically, how we're connected through the fabric <laughs> that yeah. we'll make the costumes, but, you know, me and Rebecca, we're going to, you know, we'll do some spiritual exercises to bond us, but we should also think mm. ramifications of us going out yeah. 
yeah. especially in this neighbourhood, which is really poor, you know, the crime, I mean, it's, it's like a hardcore mm. neighbourhood, you know, yeah. but like how we're going to use play, because mm -hmm. I think that that's the one thing, is that the best, <laughs> the best cults, you know, at the beginning, they, they do have a playful aspect, you know, so play can, play can help us and protect us, but it can, you know, so mm. I just, I'm just bringing yeah. up things that I don't have any answers, but we should think about them. Yeah. If we're starting a political party or, or we're, whatever we're giving out to the masses on Saturday, it's interesting in that, mm. you know, in this discussion. Just yeah. No, it makes me think a lot about um, your conversation moving us for it moved me. We later talked yesterday about how shame was playing a role in um, how we have to be so solution based and this kind of utter embarrassment and also kind of undefending this old shame. And I feel the same thing in this conversation that it, this whole idea feels like. Because from the get-go, I have to say, I was like, I want that. I want that meaning. I want that connection and the sweet. Mm -hmm. And it's an embarrassing thing to admit yeah. this unbelievably primal nature in us to connect and create together mm -hmm. and to band in a small group like that. And at the same time, it's incredibly dangerous to be that yeah. vulnerable. And so... But it how feels, do we protect ourselves? But it feels... Real? Against the uh, yeah, against yeah. the current mm. that's gonna it's gonna eat us when we go out. Well, the I think know. my question with it in terms of what you just said is is one to know in ourselves that we're kind of alchemizing shame by doing the work we're doing and challenging it without a solution, but also coming mm. from from this place. And to me, that's one one sense of like within and without is the same and to mm. just hold a certain concept of it but i think the truth is entering the world as a small unit it is vulnerable and yeah. making peace with that true i mean yeah because we're a small unit we're not trying to <laughs> we're not trying to harm or have power over the other people we just want to play for mm. the interact i think that yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but that's that's the main thing exactly yeah. But that's but where my still, we will have people yeah, yeah. Onto us. Yeah. and that's it. But that's the the minority influence. And um, I actually my research was how a minority can change the views of a majority and how it what it needs to be and how it needs to act to be the mo more most effective. Okay. And the first rule is that it has to be very clear about the message. And it has to be consistent with that message in time. So it has to have, uh, but it ha th this message cannot be rigid. So if the situation changes, uh, the message has to change appropriately. So appropriately solid, but not as in a copy-paste mm. type of thing. So people you know, understand that it's a living uh, being behind this message. It's not like a computer-generated um, ideology. So this is one. So obviously for this to function, um, the group has to be very solid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so the gr group has to be very solid and it has to have, um, you know, it has to be tightly knit. It has to have uh, a common identity. It has to have a feeling of belonging there. So this is what we're actually are attracted to. And in the biosphere, uh, Two, this is actually what people wanted, mm -hmm. you know, going there and being a part, returning back to Eden. So being a part of that, you know, clear reality. But the downfall of minorities is usually that they become too closed. Mm -hmm. And this is also what happened in the biodome. And um, because if you can't become too closed and are not willing to communicate with the outside, then you're, it's much easier to project negative things onto you because it's much easier that the, um, the general society sees you as the other. Mm -hmm. But if you manage to connect and establish other links, it's much more difficult to project the 
label of other onto you. I mean, if we're also, you know, uh, you're, you're in this group, but at the same time, um, so you're in this other group, but at the same time, you know, we, uh, we live in the same block, or uh, we go to the same church, or, you know, we study at the same high school, or whatever. We listen to the same music, and I saw you in that concert. You know, you're human, and it's hard for me to demonize you. But I, I do feel, though, that we should point out that the minority, um, just because you're a minority doesn't make you, you know, because from this perspective, it's a bit dangerous because, for example, what happened with Brexit, that was the minority that took over the majority. Mm -hmm. And because it's hate-filled, mm -hmm. like yeah. it's like a hate-filled way of, you know, the, it's just needed, I feel like we should note. It doesn't have we're to be positive. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that hasn't come up in the discussion. Yeah. But, you know, the minority take care of you, the majority is not necessarily a positive thing. Yeah. It can mm -hmm. be a yeah. negative thing. It can, yeah. yeah. So it's not like, oh, all the minority, let's feel sorry for them because they're the minority, you know. Right. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, the minority can <laughs> be really destructive. Exactly. Yeah. Like not that. like the alt-right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. like that. And we're living it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's Very much. spread yeah. around the world. Well, like ISIS, we want to talk about ISIS, yeah. That's a pretty, uh, yeah. pretty strong cult. And also how they're, they wasn't, it's not their intention. To well, I don't know if it's their intention to demonise uh, Islam, maybe. but they've kind of, from a small group, they've changed the perception of, of, of the Islam culture for many, many people in the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through their actions, and that's um, that's an incredible change. You know, a small group, a relatively small group of people um, who have completely changed the way a lot of people view, um, you know, Muslim people. And it's kind of fueled by lots of different things. There's already the other in there. There's mm -hmm. already, you know, a, a fear of other people, and that gets mixed then with this other kind of uh, these kind of enormous events, these kind of spectacles, and then that's kind of yeah, it's kind of influencing how people think about other people. Yeah. And this brings up the question uh, of correlation between a heresy and a cult, because the brink is rather subtle. Mm -hmm. Because that's what was with Christianity, for example, and all of the attributes of a cult that you named were there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But they, w what I liked about Christianity, because when I, I studied a bit about how it diffused from little cults, because there were like a lot of little groups at the time of Jesus, if he was alive or not, doesn't matter. But um, it was this one person, uh, I think it was Paul, but not the uh, Apostle Paul, some, somebody else who decided that in order for the, um, this view, this religion to spread, they're going to have to make some uh, adjustments. So they used Judas as the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are not Ju Judaism. We're something new. Um, they copied a lot of already existing uh, native uh, dates, celebration dates, and kind of projected onto that. So that's why we have a lot of, so, uh, the 24th of December is yeah, Christmas and all of that. So he said, we're going to have to do a lot of um, adjusting and a lot of changing for us to be accepted. And it was a genius marketing move, but this is what it is. But don't forget the art either, because all of a sudden, yeah. like, it's really complex, beautiful art that we had because it's really symbolized, stylized, iconic yeah. versions to pedal and all the imagery was like repeated colors and, yeah. and, and done. I think art is super important in these types of things because, I mean, even Hitler, when you look at the posters and everything else, <laughs> no, see, it's, it's the art and, uh, you know, mm. in a poli po political movements, this is, it's, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. thinking, so thinking about Grace's question about when we go out to the community, yeah. so I was thinking, like, how I mean, now we're isolated, right, and we're in the art, right, but mm -hmm. when we're out in the community, we won't be isolated, we'll sort of be taking, and we will be, you know, the, the praying and protesting, but we'll be taking the message out, and so it also made me think about the exercise <coughs> this morning about um, the stopping and gazing, especially the last one about, like, this person has made the commitment to be here, this person believes that we can have a healthy planet, this person, so to me, the, we're, we're sort of maybe like a cult in here, but we won't be 
out there because first of all, we're inviting people in and we're giving them a gift. The barbecue is like a gift. And so the question is how to, um, how to make it dispersed. I mean, it'd be different if we're staying and living here for another two years in yeah. this community, right? You know, bigger, more and more people sleeping in here, but we're not. It's like how to, how, to develop, how to develop a dispersed community of people committed to working mm -hmm. for a healthier life, well, we, right? I mean, we and the staff have been doing that yeah. for the last few months, you know, knowing Working with, working with the community. local community right. to invite them for different reasons, yeah. you know. Right. That's not a bigger process. Because yeah, that does right. seem like yeah. something. I was just thinking yesterday when we kind of opened up that that was going to happen. It does seem like normally that's something we would want to mm. have to start doing before. But so it's good. To yeah, know. this is just the icing on the cake. I've yeah. already been doing okay. that okay. work. Hey, Gordo so, and I had a chance to go to because we got here early, so we went yeah. to like a local park. And I just want to say, um, part of not feeling like we're the other is to not see them as the other. Mm -hmm. And when we were in that park, we got like warm conversations and connections from everybody. And it was, and they were in the role of recruiting. And can you help us with this healthcare movement in Africa and this over here? And it was all social services. It was a fact. Yeah, it was and it was, <laughs> and it was pretty much booth after booth of social services. Wow. So but that was. For that special occasion, yes. for this borough, that's not normally there. No, but I think for our yeah. mind to, in that way, that one, to know there'll be some expanse into that kind of shame body or that fear body of other and self and stuff and to just know it and we'll do work to protect ourselves and to prepare ourselves for it. But also, I think, um, see them. I, I wouldn't. Like to adjust two comments. I think there are some common values going beyond whatever you belong to. One is curiosity. Sorry, we're going to have curious. to stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you, be so, do you mind carrying yeah, on outside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The food's ready. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs>